October Forest History. Welcome to the Forest History Association of Wisconsin's October webinar. Uh, tonight we have the good fortune of having Brad Castleberry from the UW Stevens Point Argy Archives talking to us about uh, the Forest History Association of Wisconsin and related collections at the UWSP archives. Uh, the presentation will primarily focus on the Forest History Association collection, but also some of the other things found at the UWSP archives. Uh, basically, it will, the main focus will be on the Forest History Association archives and then kind of just briefly touching on the other connect collections. Uh, Brad received his uh, Bachelor of Arts in History from the UW Stevens Point and a master's degree in library and information science with an archives concentration from UW Milwaukee. He works or has worked at the UWSP archives since 2010, originally as a volunteer and then worked up to become the university archivist. He currently lives in Amherst with his wife, Diane, uh, son Alex and two cats. And uh, a little bit of housekeeping before I turn it over to Brad. Uh, if you have questions that come up anytime during the conversation tonight, uh, enter them into the chat feature and we will at the end of the talk, uh, relay those messages or those questions to Brad and give him a chance to answer them. Also, if you have any problems uh, with the reception or anything tonight, enter that into chat also. And Tom and I will kind of keep an eye out for those problems and see what we can do in the background. And so with no further delay, I'm gonna turn this over to Brad. Brad, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you everybody for being here or uh, watching it on a recording, either way, um, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna start by explaining what the UWSP archives is just very broadly. Um, we are an archive made up of three uh, main collections. We have the university archives, we're an area research center, and we also house a portion of the Portage County Historical Society archives. Uh, the university archives are of course made up of department records. Uh, there's quite a few manuscript collections relating to university history or alumni from the university, uh, things like that. And of course we have reference materials relating to university history, um, video recordings of basketball games and yearbooks of course, and student directories and tons and tons of photographs. Um, as an area research center, uh, what that means if, if you don't know, um, the Wisconsin Historical Society um, has area research centers across the state of Wisconsin housed at uh, all the university campuses. Um, and we handle uh, the nine central Wisconsin counties. So um, state historical society records that were created in our area are then brought back to the area at Stevens Point to make, uh, make them more accessible to the people that created them. So most of those records are government records. There's also manuscript records. Uh, for example, we have uh, George Stevens letters that he wrote back to his financiers in New York uh, before he, um, or while he was uh, on his way to Wausau to do his lumbering. Um, uh, we also have large collections of tax rolls and court records and um, uh, yeah, naturalization records, um, all of which are used greatly by genealogists. Um, and then we also have the Portage County Historical Society collection like I said, uh, it's just a portion of their collection, but it's it's uh, very local history oriented. Of course, it's it's only about Portage County, and uh, it's always used. You know, people researching uh, local people or businesses. Um, actually, businesses use the resources a lot. Um, people decorating the inside of new businesses come get historic photographs. Uh, you know, to spruce things up. Uh, genealogists uh, constantly use the collection. Um, so we're, we're a very um, diverse uh, collection in our archives. And the uh, people that we serve, uh, also very important. We, um, 
we we service the broad spectrum of researchers. Students, of course, are our main um, researcher. They they are the most frequent visitors to the archives, um, and they come from a variety of classes. Uh, it's not just history students, for example, which which most people think. Um, we have people uh, coming from the fine arts to use our um, artist book collection, for example. We have CNR people using our forest history and fisheries uh, collections, things like that. Uh, we even have uh, people from the communication department come use our historic video game collection uh, to see how that has evolved over time. Uh, we also cater to academics, of course, professors and other professionals such as authors use our resources all the time. Um, a lot of times, you know, it's local historians or um, uh, or people getting items through the ARC network uh, from the State Historical Society. And uh, local historians, like I just mentioned, um, are a, a big user of the archives. Um, it seems like uh, every other month somebody is researching or writing a book about an aspect of local history or about their family, um, and they need to do research on, on the people or places. Genealogists um, use the archives quite a bit. Uh, like I said, uh, they use naturalizations and tax rolls. Um, we also have birth, death, and marriage records. We have obituaries for Stevens Point um, and the naturalizations that I mentioned. Uh, we have land records. Uh, so they're all very valuable to genealogists. And businesses, which um, I mentioned earlier, use our photographs to decorate their, their new uh, their new buildings. Um, a lot of times they research their own history. Um, if they've been established in the area for a long time, they wanna know, um, if they don't already know, they wanna know who started the business, um, if the building had moved, uh, things like that. So as far as the Forest History Association of Wisconsin collection, why did they choose UWSP? Uh, well, negotiations began in 1981. I actually did some research on this because I originally uh, saw that it had 2001 and I thought, no, that's that's way too recent. So I went back and dug through uh, our archives and uh, saw that in 1981, the idea came up. Um, and within a year, um, everybody had agreed that yes, uh, this would be a good location for the archives of FHAW. Um, and the, these are some of the reasons for it. Uh, of course, the campus has a forestry program, um, other natural resource programs. So th there's a student base of interest to use uh, these materials. The geographical access, um, because we're located centrally in the state and towards uh, the Northern woods, um, it's not too far of a drive for people to come do research. Uh, the environmental conditions of the archives, uh, we have temperature control, we have humidity control, uh, we have security. Um, we don't allow access to things unless we're present. Doors are always locked. Um, and uh, the final, and it seems to be sticking point back in the day was uh, room for growth. Um, back in the early eighties, uh, the university library was actually kind of busting at the seams when FHAW uh, approached us. And um, fortunately at that time, we were planning on expanding the library. And I think it was in 1985, um, we added another floor and we, we uh, expanded out um, north, south, east and west of the building. Uh, so uh, we were able to settle the nerves uh, that we'd have a lot more space uh, for, for your items. And um, it's kind of come full circle, uh, as some of you may know, we are again getting a new building. Um, so next summer or, or fall, uh, they will be tearing down Albertson Hall where the archives is located. And two or three years later, we should have a new building. So again, we're gonna be expanding a little and have even more room for growth because truth be told, um, the archives is running out of space um, and, and archives are constantly growing. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. So the accessions for FHAW, um, of course there was, was the original donation. It was um, 
It was rather small. Um, it was, uh, I would say, two or three record center boxes, not a huge amount of materials. Um, and this was back in the early 80s. Uh, and then there's, there's been small additions over the past 30 years, um, just a sprinkling here and there, not too much. Um, but in the last five years, three years for sure, there has been a huge push uh, by the association to, um, to get their archives um, collected and to get them moved to the UW-Stevens Point archives to have them uh, organized and preserved which is fantastic. I'm glad that the initiative has been taken. Um, otherwise, these types of things are lost forever. Um, I would say that the amount of donations in the last three years is probably five or six times of what we had gotten for the previous 30 years. So things have really picked up quickly, um, but we are trying to keep up. <laughs> so processing and preservation, I wanna talk about of the collection. Um, once the accessions come in, um, it's our job to make them accessible, easy to use and understandable by the user. And because uh, all these records were collected or created by an organization, we, we do our absolutely best effort to maintain the original order of the creator. So that would be FHAW, um, especially when it comes to the organizational papers. Um, when you guys, um, organize these things. You did it for a reason. Or you did it the way you did for a reason um, because it was the easiest way. Uh, so we don't want to uh, redo anything that is already working for you. So we, we try to keep the original order. Um, sometimes we get folders that aren't labeled or the labels have fallen off or, you know, things weren't put in chronological order. So we fix that kind of stuff. Um, but overall, we try to keep, keep it the way it comes in. We also apply basic preservation to everything that is processed. And that means sleeving photographs and negatives. We put them in um, chemically inert uh, uh, see-through sleeves, uh, polyester sleeves. Um, we also do, uh, we remove binder clips, paper clips, anything that might rust and damage paper. Um, rubber bands are, are a constant pain. They always become brittle, they stain the paper, they stain the other side of the paper that it's not even holding. Um, usually when donations come in, uh, there's dead bugs to deal with, there's animal dropping. So all that gets cleaned up and <laughs> we make sure there's not any, any uh, water damage on anything um, and things like that. And then photocopying, newspaper clippings. Um, uh, I pointed this out specifically because Collections always come with clippings. Um, they're an excellent source of information, historical information. Um, so there's always folders and folders of newspaper clippings and newspaper is notoriously horrible uh, quality paper. Uh, so they deteriorate quickly, they become brittle, they stain anything they touch. So we photocopy all newspaper clippings, throw away the originals and keep the copies. Another thing we do for uh, processing and preservation is the dig digitization of the materials. Um, I've been doing more of this with this collection because it's, it's in a higher demand. Um, we don't do it for every collection, uh, but it is a, a form of preservation. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit more uh, later on. So the components of the collection are named for the creator of the individual that don't of the donated portion in the order that they were donated. So this is a large collection. It's 30 boxes, I believe. Um, and like I said, we get, we get donations um, and additions to the collection over time. It's been over 40 years. So everything doesn't come at once. Um, so I have listed here all the, um, components, or you can think of them as series within the larger collection. Uh, and they're titled by uh, who collected the material um, or who donated it. So for example, number, let's look at number five, Cal Scott and Richard Smith. Um, that material is not going to be about 
Cal Stott and Richard Smith necessarily. Um, they are the ones who collected the records that are in boxes nine through 13. Um, you're gonna get some biographical information um, about them. You're gonna get information about the research they did and things like that, but um, don't assume that the title of a component is necessarily um, its, main, <laughs> its main subject, if that makes sense. Um, number six, for example, the administrative papers and subject files, that of course is exactly what it sounds like. Um, so there won't be a surprise in that, but that is why we have finding aids. And um, so it is easier to understand what is inside the collection. So digitization quickly, um, like I said, it's another form of preservation and, and organization. Um, for the photos, uh, they're all scanned at 600 DPI TIFFs. Um, that is the standard for a preservation digital copy. Um, that way, um, that's the highest. Okay, so that's gonna be um, like for storage for later. If you wanna use your copy, uh, they can be reduced down to 300 JPEG to be you know, put in emails and sent to people. Um, but this is the preservation level. The documents are all scanned at 300 DPI PDFs. Um, and I've digitized six boxes so far of this collection. Um, and there's 24 boxes to go. And just to give you an idea, uh, to do the six boxes, I think it came out to 80 hours of work. <laughs> so if you multiply that out for 24 boxes, we have a considerable way to go. Um, but it's absolutely worth it, in my opinion. Um, it is time well spent, and I've never regretted digitizing uh, a collection for many reasons. So the collection itself, um, it's kind of broken up into two parts. There's the manuscript collection, which is what I've been talking about, uh, the actual papers uh, that, that you kind of leaf through, um, and to access them, we have finding aids and we have Preservica. The finding aids are the folder lists, basically, um, that give the titles of each folder in one document. And then there's Preservica. Preservica is the uh, digital content management system that we use at the archives. Um, so everything that's digitized is put on there so that it can be accessed by the public. And then we also have the book collection portion. Um, Luckily, all that has been put into the library catalog, so it's easily discoverable. Um, and there's about 350 titles in there right now. So I just want to give you some a quick look at how to find these things. Um, if you want to do research, this is an example of the finding aid. This is a this is the top part of it. This is the first box, um, and as you can see, the Banzaf portion series. Um, and it's just a list of the folder titles. So these are all the folders in box one. So obviously you can pull subjects of interest out of this. Um, and it's, it's a good starting point for doing your research. Now to find the uh, digital part of the collection is, it's a little more convoluted. Um, so if you go to our archives homepage, which the easiest way to get there is to just Google UWSP archives. On the left side, uh, under, under the archives tab there, you can see uh, digital collections right here and uh, click on that. It's gonna bring you to this page and then click on this top one, UWSP universal access. That is what uh, the Preservica public facing site is called. And then this is what the Preservica page looks like. Uh, so this is everything that we have digitized, like I said, <clears throat> and they're broken down by type of material. So you can see all of our finding aids there on the top, the PCHS collections, PCHS vertical files, our student newspaper, UWSP collections, and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, FHAW collection is in the UWSP collection. So we would click on that and it brings you to the box list, which is the broad um, 
uh, Broadway looking at the collection. And like I said, we only have six boxes digitized so far. So if you had looked at the finding aid and you know specifically what you want in boxes one through six, uh, you just click on the box you want, or of course you can just browse and look at what's in them. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is the um, folder list for that box. And this is gonna line up perfectly with the folder list on the finding aid. It's the exact same titles. Um, we wanna make this as easy as possible to navigate. So everything is, is the same. Uh, and then you're gonna click on the folder title that you wanna look at, and you're gonna have scans of the original documents. So there's many layers to get to the uh, primary sources, um, but it's, it, it's, it's uh, a lot easier to access than, than necessarily having to come into the archives. And then quickly, I wanted to look at just how to find the uh, forest history books. This is our library catalog. Um, again, the easiest way to get to it is just Google UWSP library. This is the homepage for it. And right in the middle there, under the search at UW, um, just type in uh, a book title or you can search uh, by the whole collection um, and then it'll bring up uh, relevant items. And I should mention before moving ahead, um, the book collection, unlike the archives collection, does circulate. Um, so if you do have a library card, um, you can check them out, which is nice. People, people are always surprised and happy that they can take them out of the archives. So a part of this um, project um, has been identifying subjects within the FHAW collection that might be of interest to researchers um, or that might be buried in the collection that might have gone missing. Um, so I pulled out some here uh, that might be of interest in research value. Um, there's the uh, research and general interest of the record collector. Like I said, each component or addition to the collection, um, you can be able to find some information on those that donated the collection or did the collecting of that series. Um, of course, the history of FHAW organization is going to be, uh, this is the place to go to find that. There's minutes uh, for, for all the committees. There's publications such as newsletters, um, there's members lists, there's correspondence. I believe there's the original charter in there. Um, I might be wrong on that, but um, this is the place to get the history of the organization. Um, and some other interesting topics uh, I found was uh, farm timber, uh, the Forest History Hall of Fame inductees, log marks, logging equipment, which I actually got a call about today, uh, the one billionth tree planting, um, which you know, I'm not an expert in the subject area at all, but that sounded interesting to me. So that's why I put that one in there. Uh, the Peshtigo fire, which I'm sure all of you have, have had your fill of lately. Um, pulpwood, stand density, uh, the Tigerton Lumber Company and tree farming. So some of the new and ongoing projects uh, with the collection um, includes Nat National History Day. Um, let me get my notes here. Let me make sure I mention everything about that because um, we are just getting that up and running. Um, we are working with Pat Stovey of UW Lacrosse who has created a friendly finding aid um, which is used by National History Day students um, and it has uh, subject areas and within those subject areas, you there's links to uh, primary sources, secondary sources, things like that. So we are getting this collection ready to be included in that finding aid, hopefully. Um, so that's why I have been working on pulling out subjects of interest uh, as well, like, like I showed you on the uh, previous slide. Um, and interns are going to prove to be uh, incredibly important for this project. Um, we need help um, digitizing. We need uh, help finding more subjects, getting things online, uh, and also processing um, uh, 
uh, new accessions as they come in. Um, so the University Archives is working with FHAW and also the History Department at UWSP uh, to get an intern in um, next semester, I believe, to get started on this project. And of course, continuing to digitize the collection uh, is a huge ongoing project. Um, we'll, I'll work on that, interns will work on that. Um, and then I forgot to put on the list here, but um, the accessions coming in, uh, they don't stop coming in. Uh, so it's, it's something that always has to be added to the collection. Um, you, everything needs to be refolded, it needs to be preserved and, um, and put in order. So I'm gonna talk about some related collections that we have at the archives. Um, the Wisconsin Forestry Hall of Fame collection uh, is, is in the archives. Um, it's a Hall of Fame inductees, of course, biographical information. Um, there's information on the ceremonies. There's pamphlets for the um, Forestry Hall of Fame correspondence about the creation of it and about the ceremonies and, and those kinds of things. And there's also the bylaws and charter uh, for the Forest History Hall of Fame. Another is the Society of American Foresters collection. Uh, this is actually a very large collection. Um, it is full of information. I just pulled out um, some things of interest here. There's committee minutes, there's membership information, uh, the newsletters, uh, oral histories, publications, um, different chapters within Wisconsin um, of the Society of American Foresters. Uh, there's photographs that go along with this collection and also projects that were worked on. Another is the Michael Dombeck papers. Um, these were given to us quite a while ago. Um, they've actually been digitized as well. Um, and they are available on um, Recollection Wisconsin, I believe. Um, so Michael Dombeck, the papers that we have mostly cover his time as Bureau of Land Management Acting Director and as his time as Forest Service Chief. Uh, so a lot of them are administrative papers, things like that. Um, there's a lot of information about the road list rule, um, scrapbooks from his time uh, in these organizations, clippings, photographs, and a lot of his publications and speeches that he gave uh, while he was forest chief. And then also of interest is the Jay Cravens collection. Uh, he worked for the US Forest Service uh, for almost 30 years. And then he worked for, I believe the State Department, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But then he was also a forestry professor for UWSP for many, many years. Um, and some of the interesting uh, stuff in his collection include defoliation in Vietnam, especially uh, the use of Agent Orange. We've actually had a lot of students uh, do research on that and use these resources. George Banzaff and Company, uh, publications, uh, Smokey Bear. Um, maybe everybody already knows this, but I always thought it was cool that um, he was actually a part of the uh, firefighters that saved the bear that was the inspiration for Smokey Bear. Um, so I think that's a cool connection. Uh, international forestry and wildfires. Um, and this is, this is also on our archives homepage. Uh, on the left side there is the menu bar and on the bottom it says select collections and content. And we have a section for conservation and environmental collections. So there's more on here than than what I just talked about. And there's, these are the, I'm sorry, these are finding aids uh, for the collections. Um, so there's additional resources here. Um, there's also some finding aids here for the ones I mentioned, but not all of them. Um, of course, uh, I recommend contacting the archives or me directly if you want um, finding aids or if you have a subject area you're interested in. We don't expect people to track down all the resources on their own. Um, there's a lot to trudge through, uh, so please contact us uh, if you have if you have questions or research ideas. So that is all I had. Um, if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to entertain them.
So uh, thanks, uh, Brad. This is Tom Giroux. I'm going to be facilitating the Q&A here. So we've got a few questions in there. And I'm just going to start off right away. How many staff do you have to do all of this? It seems like a, a pretty big uh, job. It's a huge job. <laughs> um, there's two professional archivists. Um, and we have three students that work about 10 hours a week. And usually we have one intern. Um, and that's it. That, that's our full staff. Uh, we're going to have an extra intern that's going to specifically work on processing this collection, though, uh, next semester. So that's going to help a lot. Uh, does a person have to be on site for access? Uh, can you, how much of it is it accessible online? You kind of covered a little bit of this, I think, but. Yeah, there's. <sighs> There's very little online, to be honest with you. Um, I would recommend contacting us <clears throat> and um, we'll let you know, honestly. Um, if it's online, we'll send you direct links so you don't have to go through everything. Um, we'll make it real easy. We'll just email it back to you. And we'll also find what you're interested in in the finding aids for you. So um, we'll compile a list so when you do come in, um, it'll be bang, bang, and we'll have the materials for you. Uh, so this is uh, my question, uh, you know, uh, serving on the board of directors, I should know this, but uh, what does this cost the Forest History Association of Wisconsin to have our materials archived right here? Um, it's been, I believe, zero dollars so far. Um, like I said, uh, I believe uh, your organization is fully funding the um, the uh, the intern, um, which I do believe I'm going out on a limb here um, is fifteen hundred dollars um, to finance that. But other than that, um, we take care of the materials, the folders, the like I said, staff time does the processing for the most part, um, and we, we provide the boxes and everything. Uh, if uh, people have items related to the Forest History Association of Wisconsin collection, how would they go about donating them? Uh, you can just stop in at the archives. Uh, we were closed to the public for a while for COVID, but we are now open our regular hours, um, 10 to noon, 1 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. So you can stop in during those times or you can mail uh, items to us. Um, if it's a massive amount of stuff, we can arrange for, uh, I've gone places and picked stuff up. If it's a truckload of stuff, um, there's lots of ways. Just hold on a second here. Uh, wonderful presentation. Would you have room for an additional 150 boxes of FHAW material over time? Uh, yeah, over time. <laughs> right now, no way. Um, especially since we have to move it all. Um, but once the new building's up, we could uh, talk about that. Are you able to accept PowerPoint? Yes. Um, I mentioned we have two professional archivists. Um, uh, the other archivist job is partially digital archivist. So we are getting into uh, digital archiving uh, much better than we were say five years ago. So digital records we take. Um, I do believe actually that we accepted, um, I think a flash drive of FHAW records on uh, the last donation. So. We have the capacity to deal with large digital collections now as well. Uh, so we'll be able to uh, uh, archive this uh, presentation, I would assume. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. I could watch it weekly then. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was uh, just thinking about uh, 
just from your perspective, the materials you've gone through, what's the most interesting thing you've run across in our, in our collection that uh, might surprise some of the people online here? Um, I don't, uh, I don't know if there is anything that's surprising. Um, I guess it's more interest to me personally. Right. I've always had an interest in the Peshtigo fire, which I know you guys are probably sick of talking about. Um, but there's, you know, there, I think the centennial information was in the collection. Um, so there was cool stuff to look at with that um, old flyers and photographs. Um, photos are always a favorite of mine and most people because they're, they're a, a snapshot in time and they, they transport you back. Um, so I always love old photos. Uh, can you mention Jack Valier's collection at UWSB, UWSB the photos? Um, okay, that one caught me off guard a little. Um, I'm very familiar with, with Jack. Jack's collections, but all I can think of is his goblet collection right now. Um, Don, you can unmute if you want. Um, I know they were very generous donors to the university. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. One of the things Jack did was he collected postcards of logging operations from the 1880s to oh, the 1900s. Yes. And he donated them all to the university. I think yes. There was... um, we had a, uh, it wasn't a natural resource class. It was, uh, it was a class in the communications that used to come in. They haven't in the last couple of years, but we would fill the tables with those photos, just hundreds of them. And they would scan them for this project that they did every semester. So those got heavy use. Um, and people love log or old logging photos. I can tell you that, um, especially uh, those star load photos that have the ginormous trees, you know, piled on a horse drawn sleigh. Um, people love those things. Many of those were, uh, you know, s set Staged. up. Yeah. 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 But that's, some of them were real. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing what those, the work those horses did do. Oh, yeah. I might have one over here in Q&A yet. Uh, lots of uh, accolades. They appreciate your presentation out there. Thank you. It sounds like uh, if you're, uh, it's an, it sounds like it's an interesting place to visit. Uh, it, it is. I, uh, anybody that wants to come take a little tour, we, uh, we have a lot of interesting things we can show you. Um, there's always stuff there that people don't expect us to have. Um, so yeah, if you're ever in town, come and visit us. Um, maybe you could say a little bit about the uh, system of history centers across the state. You know, there might be uh, folks that want to do research more locally. Yeah, um, the Area Research Center Network, uh, like I said, it's, um, it's on all the UW campuses and UW-Madison and then um, in Ashland at the, um, I always forget the name of that place. Great Lakes Visitor Center. Center. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, we transfer materials between all those places. Um, so if you find material that you want transferred, we can absolutely do it. Uh, the way to find the material is to go into the UW Madison library catalog um, and, and search for material in there. You, there on the right hand side of the page, there's a search function called mixed material. You wanna check that box. Mixed material means archival material. Uh, so click that box, type in the keyword search box, anything you're interested in. Um, and it can be transferred to your nearest archive. Um, and all the archivists, we all know each other um, and we're all 
very willing to help each other out. So for example, if there's something at Stevens Point that you want transferred to Green Bay that is not part of the state of Wisconsin Historical Society, but it's in say the FHAW collection, be more, I would be more than willing to transfer it um, so you don't have to drive all the way to Stevens Point. Um, so it's a great opportunity for people to look at um, research materials without having to drive. And this is unique to the state of Wisconsin. There's no other transfer system for archival materials in the world. Um, so please take advantage of it. Just, uh, I've got another one in the Q&A over here. Best way to contact you? Um, go to our website and there's a phone number, 715-346-2586 <laughs> um, or our email, which is archives at uwsp.edu. Um, those are the two best ways. Email is probably better because then we have a, a written record. <laughs> and we we'll, we won't forget anything uh, i know that i've uh, corresponded with the folks at the great lakes visitor center they're very helpful and mm -hmm. uh you know point in the right direction if they don't have the materials uh, uh it's just a wonderful resource that we have in the state like you said that other folks don't have yeah yeah it's really it's really great i know i've uh I've done some research in Michigan and it's not nearly as coordinated uh, and the various archives don't necessarily communicate well together, that kind of stuff. So it's really nice uh, to do research in Wisconsin where everything, at least from my perspective, appears to be connected and working together. I think, Donald, do you want to talk about next month? Sure. Well, first off, I'd like to say thanks to Brad on behalf of the association and the people that are watching tonight, because I think you gave a really good overview of what we have at the Forest History Archives at the UWSP. And I think people, now that they know that it's there, will have a better chance of using it. And, and I think what you do, uh, for preserving our records for us is really important. So thank you for all your efforts. Uh, next welcome. month, uh, we have uh, Tom Stanley talking to us about hoisting pulpwood at Ashland. Uh, the title of the talk is Hoisting Pulpwood, A Century of Hoisting Operations on the Chiquamagan Bay, uh, uh, 1872 to 1972. And he's gonna talk about uh, his experience he says it's part memoir, memoir and part presentation of a story, but he's going to talk to us about the pulpwood hoisting at Ashman. It should be real interesting. And so that would be on Wednesday, November 17th at uh, 6.30 p.m. And I hope you can join us for that. And with that, I will sign off for tonight. Thank you again, Brad. And thank you thank all you. for joining us tonight. Very nice. Thank you.